ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution and our World Affairs program. Uh, my name is Andreas Vasmud. I'm one of the directors here at the Bath Royal. I'm also, for my sins, the convener for World Affairs and for philosophy. So welcome all and to what will be a very important topic tonight. So thank you for turning up. It gives me great, great pleasure to welcome Tom, to, uh, and uh, Veronica to the uh, to the BLSI tonight uh, to give a talk on mining mobility in Latin American communities, a very important topic around uh, uh, communities living with commerciality and increased mining intensity in in Latin America. Um, Tom is very very multi talented. He's a, he's a, he used to be a teacher, a writer, a researcher, an author. Uh, and also an activist. So currently he worked for the uh, the uh, Latin America Bureau, which I think gave rise to his book, The Heart of Our Earth. And uh, he's also engaged at the University of Bath as a research assistant in tobacco, and uh, what's it, tobacco? Yeah, tobacco tactics, which is basically, I, I, I named him a provocateur for uh, naming corporates misbehaving is basically what he's good at. You know, he's really trying to hold big commercial organizations to task. So he, the, he has his book with him and Veronica kindly agreed to sell his book, The Center of Our Earth, uh, for £16.50 later on, if you're interested and uh, he has piqued your interest with the talk. But for now, please put your hands together for Tom Gatehouse. Okay, so hello and good evening to everyone here and to everyone who's joined us online. And thank you very much to Andreas and the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution for the invitation. So yeah, my name is Tom Gatehouse. I'm an editor at Latin America Bureau and author of the book, The Heart of Our Earth, Community Resistance to Mining in Latin America. And as Andreas said, um, hopefully there'll be some time left over at the end if you wish to buy a copy. Uh, I've also brought a, a number of other selected lab titles, including um, Voices of Latin America, which is the product of a previous project I worked on, which is about um, social movements and kind of the new activism in the region. So yes, yeah, so I also work at the University of Bath as a researcher in the Tobacco Control Research Group, but this evening I'm here in my capacity as lab editor. And I'm gonna to talk to you about a different harmful industry, so namely mining, with a particular focus on lithium mining in the Atacama Desert in the north of Chile. So as I'm sure many of you already know, lithium is an essential ingredient of lithium ion batteries. And they're a component of many of the technologies that we're going to need for the energy transition. So that is the phasing out of fossil fuels and their replacement with renewable energy and greener technology. So we'll start here. So this is a still taken from a CNN Chile news item. And the text reads, work suspended on the Salar de Atacama due to roadblock. So this is recent news. Back in January, SQM, which is the world's largest lithium producer, was forced to pause its operations on the Salar de Atacama for nearly a week. So the Salar de Atacama is a salt flat in the desert and it's the richest source of lithium in the world, and currently 100% of Chile's lithium is extracted from beneath it. And the reason for the stoppage was that the company's access to the Salar had been blocked by an organization called the Consejo de Pueblos Atacameños, which brings together 18 local indigenous communities. And the Atacameños were unhappy with a new memorandum of understanding between SQM, which is a private company, and the Chilean state copper mining company, Codelco. And if this deal goes ahead, it will result in a major new public-private partnership, which would nearly double the current quota for lithium production and also extend SQM's mining concession on the Salar until 2060. Negotiations are still ongoing. It would also be one of the first pieces of President Gabriel Boric's national lithium strategy to be implemented, 
So Bodic wants to increase the participation of the Chilean state in the industry, um, including by creating a new national lithium company, as well as by these kinds of public-private partnerships. However, the Atacamenos say that this agreement was made completely behind their backs, and they only found out about it when it came out in the press. So the Sala de Atacama is the ancestral home of the Atacameños, and they are one of 11 indigenous groups recognized by law in Chile. On the left here, you can see Sara Plaza, who is um, an Atacameño woman whom we interviewed for the book, The Heart of Our Earth. And it's said that the Atacameños were the first people of Chile to extract and work with metals. There's evidence of this activity from around 1000 BC, although the modern Atacameño culture came into being between 400 and 700 AD. Traditionally, there were subsistence farmers, though more recently they've tended to focus on uh, single, more marketable crops. And in recent years, they've been developing tourism. So San Pedro de Atacama, which is kind of the main town in this region, has become a tourist hub, and it's full of agencies which offer tours out into the desert, including to see the salt flats. And the Atacameños say that mining activity in the region, so not only lithium, but also copper extraction, is destroying the delicate desert ecosystem in which they have survived for around the last 1500 years or more. And before any expansion of mining activity, they want a proper process of dialogue and consultation which is after all what's required by the Indigenous and Tribal Peoples Convention of the International Labour Organization. So better known as ILO 169, this is a binding international convention to which Chile is a signatory. And the struggles of the Atacameños, they really reflect a wider debate in Chilean society about the role and the status of the country's indigenous people. So although Chile does provide them with legal recognition, it's just one of only a handful of Latin American countries which doesn't recognize them formally in its constitution. And in the south of Chile, there has been violent confrontation in recent years between another indigenous group called the Mapuches um, against farmers, forestry companies, and other economic interests, as well as the Chilean state. And this has been a, a really ugly situation. There's been criminal criminalization, violence, even killings. This level of violence hasn't yet been seen in the Atacama, but there is potential for things to escalate if the lithium industry were to expand further. And it's notable that the roadblock that the Atacameños used back in January is a new and a more direct tactic than we've typically seen from them until now. So their principal conflict, at least when it comes to lithium extraction, has been with this company SQM. So, it's a former state-owned company which was privatized during the Pinochet dictatorship. And it was handed over to a man called Julio Ponce Leroux, who is or happens to be son-in-law of General Pinochet. And you can see in the first of these two photos, this is um, Ponce con Pinochet back in about 1976. Today, Ponce is one of Chile's richest people. And although he stepped down as chairman of SQM in 2015, he retains ownership of 17% of the company. And both Ponce and SQM have been involved in several scandals, including the illegal purchase of stocks and also the channeling of illicit campaign finance to politicians from across Chile's political spectrum. And in 2017, SQM had to pay a fine of more than $30 million to the US Securities and Exchange Commission for having violated the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. SQM has also been in trouble with Chilean environmental authorities over its activity on the Salar de Atacama. As I'll explain ahead, on the Salar de Atacama, the lithium is found in brine, so in other words, in salty groundwater. And SQM has been sanctioned for extracting more brine than it was permitted to. The Atacameños have repeatedly denounced SQM for these sorts of environmental infractions, and they have said they want to see the company removed from the Salar altogether. So why does this matter? Well, lithium today is in high demand 
and it's become ubiquitous in our daily lives due to its energy storing properties. So lithium ion batteries, they store a high volume of energy relative to their size and weight. So they're used in basically any rechargeable electronic device, including so personal electronics like mobile phones, laptops, digital cameras, power packs, e-cigarettes, smartwatches, and so on. They're also used to power personal mobility devices like e-scooters and mobility scooters. And also they'll be essential for renewable energy. So it's not so much that lithium is used to build solar panels and wind turbines, but as we move forward into the energy transition, we will need to build in massive storage capacity into our energy networks in order to ensure a steady supply of energy when the wind isn't blowing and when the sun, sun isn't shining and lithium ion batteries will be essential to this. So yes, lithium ion batteries, they're currently the best energy storage technology we have available and they'll be key for the energy transition. So this pie chart, um, this is industry produced. This was produced by a Canadian lithium mining company and it shows the expansion of the battery industry. So back in 2016, um, lithium ion batteries accounted for 42% of all lithium application. Their projection was that by 2026, this, the, the share allotted to batteries would be 86%. And I think that that estimate looks pretty reasonable. Today, um, batteries account for around 75% of lithium application. And the main reason for this, the single biggest reason is the expansion of the electric vehicle market. So the kind of personal electronic items that I was referring to a minute ago, they use only very small quantities of lithium compared to around eight to 10 kilos in your average electric vehicle. So the electric vehicle market is a rapidly growing sector. So in 2016 in the UK, just 0.4% of all newly registered vehicles were electrics. But last year it was nearly 24%, covering both fully electric cars and also plug-in hybrids and new sales of electric vehicles are increasing rapidly, as you can see in this graph from the BBC. Both the UK and the EU have pledged to phase out um, new petrol and diesel vehicles, well, in fact, to ban sales of new petrol and diesel vehicles from 2035. And several US states are also planning to do the same thing, including California, New York, and New Jersey. But last year, a study produced by a group of researchers at the Climate and Community Project in the US suggested that if we continue with current levels of car ownership and battery size, then satisfying the demands of the US electric vehicle market in 2050 would require triple the amount of lithium currently produced for the entire global market. And when you consider that other major economies are gonna be moving in the same direction at the same time, not least China, then it's clear that the pressure on global lithium supply is gonna be enormous. So in the Andes, lithium is mined from beneath ancient salt flats in um, Northern Chile, in Northwestern Argentina, and in Southwestern Bolivia. And this region has become known as the Lithium Triangle. Chile is by far the biggest producer of the three and number two in the world after Australia. Argentina is further behind, but it's expanding rapidly. Bolivia is actually thought to have the biggest resources of all, but for various reasons, the industry has yet to really take off there. And historically, the Atacama has been considered kind of a dead zone, so of value only for the mineral resources which lie beneath it. And it's been the source of two of, other, of two of Chile's other great export booms. So first there was saltpeter back in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So the, the name refers to a group of nitrate compounds and they were widely used as a fertilizer and in gunpowder. And this was a highly valuable and strategic resource which completely transformed the Chilean economy. And of course there's copper, which is still Chile's principal export and responsible for around 10% of national GDP. The Antofagasta region, so where the Salar de Atacama is located, 
is home to some of Chile's biggest and most productive copper mines. So, for example, there's Chuquicamata, which I think is the most prolific mine of the 20th century, and Escondida, which is currently the world's biggest copper mine by production. So this vision of the Atacama as a kind of dead zone has long justified massive extractive activity, and it continues to do so today in the case of lithium and other metals and minerals. In contrast with Australia, where lithium is extracted via your kind of conventional hard rock mining, in the Andes, the lithium is found in brine, so it's salty groundwater. It's about 75% water to 25% salt composed of lithium, potassium, and other substances. So as you'll see in this diagram, what the companies do is they sink wells, they pump out the brine onto these, into these vast um, evaporation ponds on the surface, they're so big that they're visible from space. And then they let the sun do the rest. So the process takes between 12 and 18 months. What's left over, which is usually a mix of lithium and other minerals, is then filtered and treated with chemicals to extract um, commercially viable lithium. And Chile has several kind of competitive advantages over its neighbors. So first of all, the lithium brines in the Salar de Atacama are of a higher grade than those found beneath um, similar salt flats in, in Argentina and in Bolivia. In other words, there's a higher concentration of lithium in the brine compared to the other substances that surround it. This area of Chile also has ideal conditions for the evaporation process, so there's virtually no rain at all, near constant sunshine and also warm winds. And the geography is also favorable. So the lithium extracted from the Salar de Atacama is then taken straight off to the port city of Antofagasta on the Pacific coast, from where it is shipped off around the world, mostly to battery manufacturers in China and Korea. So here on the left, you can see these evaporation pools, just how vast they are. So the companies routinely claim that this kind of mining is sustainable. So they highlight its lower use of energy and also the lower use of chemical agents to process the lithium. And it's true that it is a less destructive form of mining than conventional hard rock mining, and particularly the kind of massive industrial scale open pit mining, which is common throughout Chile, and particularly for copper extraction. The companies also argue that the brine is useless. It's salty groundwater, which has no agricultural or domestic use. They also claim that their evaporation process contributes to the natural water cycle. And finally, that they conduct strict environmental monitoring to ensure that there is no damage to the ecosystem. However, as we'll see ahead, these claims are contested, and I think there are some le legitimate environmental concerns. So the Atacama is the world's driest desert outside the polar regions, and yet there is water. The Salar de Atacama is surrounded by areas that have pools, lagoons, and grasslands, which are irrigated by subterranean water sources. And these aquatic environments are the remnants of lakes from millions of years ago. They're home to endemic species of plants and animals, as well as a diversity of life forms which has adapted to the hot days and freezing nights, as well as high salinity and high solar radiation. And scientists recently found plants in the Atacama that have adapted to the dry conditions but which are genetically similar to food crops. And this may have implications for how we adapt our agriculture to the demands of a warming planet in the future. Scientists also believe that the mi microbial life forms found in the Atacama are evidence of the evolution of life on Earth. And these life forms are found in the water sources, including in the brine found beneath the salt flats. They're also the base of the food chain. So they're food for more complex organisms, which in turn are food for bigger animals. And we still don't know what the long-term impacts of removing these organisms will be, but scientists believe that they're key for the health of the whole ecosystem. However, obviously, um, in a sense, the impacts are more easier to measure and more visible um, when we talk about the fauna of the region. So this includes birds, reptiles, and mammals such as desert foxes, and also guanacos, which are a ruminant similar to a llama. 
Perhaps the most famous of these are the flamingos, though. So I don't know if any of you remember from a few years back on um, BBC Planet Earth 2, there was a, a famous sequence where they had some dancing flamingos on the salt flat, and that was actually filmed on the Salar de Atacama. So three species of flamingo inhabit the Salar, feeding on brine shrimp, algae, and plankton, which are found in the salty water. Also, unsurprisingly, they're a big tourist attraction. So agencies offer tours out to the salt flats to see the birds. And this is, um, in a sense, a good example of how mining activity can conflict and even preclude other forms of economic activity. In recent years, there have been fewer flamingos observed on the Salar de Atacama. So a 2022 study published by the Royal Society suggested that numbers of two of the three endemic species were down between 10 and 12% over the previous 11 years. And the study blamed this decline squarely on mining activity, not only the extraction of the brine from the salt flats, but also on the increased noise from machinery and vehicle traffic. However, at the regional level, no such decline was observed. So this means that the effects of mining on the Salar de Atacama may be mitigated by the other Andean salaris. But of course, this won't be the case if the lithium industry continues to expand. For its part, SQM disagrees with key parts of the study and says that its own monitoring shows that flamingo numbers have remained stable. It also criticized the study for not taking into account the impact of increased tourism on flamingo numbers. But it's not just about um, the impacts on, on the animals, it also has impacts on, on the local communities. So though the companies say that their activity has no impact on the freshwater systems around the salt flat, local people disagree. So again, this is um, Sara Plaza, the Atacameño woman who I referred to earlier. And she took um, a Latin America Bureau journalist out into um, the grasslands around her village a few years back to show her the impacts of lithium mining. And her conviction is that mining is indeed drying up these grasslands, which historically they have depended on. So the theory is that under normal conditions, the brine beneath the salt flats and the freshwater systems hold each other in check. But when the brine is removed, the freshwater flows down from the higher ground to occupy the aquifer beneath the salt flats. And though the companies deny this, there is a growing body of scientific evidence which suggests it's happening. And of course, this is backed up by anecdotal evidence from the communities themselves. However, it's important to stress that the precise nature of this relationship remains unknown. And it's the companies who hold the most information. So they're the ones who've done the most in-depth research and over the longest period of time. I think SQM in particular has been um, in the region since the 1980s. So really they, they know the whole scenario far better than anyone else. And in this sense, the Chilean state has been kind of playing catch up. And this is a good example of how the industry to a certain extent is left to self-regulate. Ultimately, ultimately, it's too soon to say for sure what the precise impacts of lithium mining on the Salar de Atacama will be. But independent studies do, do point to a degree of environmental damage. I also wanted to devote um, a slide to debunk some of the industry greenwashing that you'll hear. Because of course, the mining industry in recent years has positioned itself as the gatekeeper to a low carbon world and a sustainable future. And this is very much the type of language that they're using. But mining is an inherently destructive industry, though that doesn't mean that it's inherently evil or that it should never occur. But it does mean that all mining has social and environmental costs, including that done in the name of decarbonization and fighting climate change. Mining has also made a significant historical contribution to climate change. So the mining industry contributes to greenhouse gas emissions in the following ways. First of all, it deforests large areas to make way for mining operations. And some of this deforestation, um, we can talk about the Latin American context, it's occurred in ecologically sensitive tropical forests, including the Amazon. 
Mining also requires massive amounts of energy, which is still mostly supplied via the burning of fossil fuels. Vehicles and machinery used in mining operations emit pollutants, including greenhouse gases. But most of all, mining is responsible for the extraction of coal, which I'm sure you will know is the dirtiest, most carbon intensive fossil fuel. And if these indirect emissions are considered, so essentially um, the burning of coal by the energy companies that the mining industry provides, then the overall historical contribution of mining to global greenhouse gas emissions is likely to be significant. Another related point is that the mining industry continues to extract me uh, metals and minerals with no green application. And one good example of this is gold, which has not only no green application, but also fairly limited industrial use. So most gold is converted into jewelry or into ingots, so to go into gold bars and stored in bank vaults as a low risk investment. But gold mining is enormously destructive and has caused major environmental impacts all over the world, including in Latin America, particularly due to the use of mercury um, to, to extract the gold from the amalgam. Gold mining also accounts for 21% of all tailings or mining waste. And this presents us with another serious long-term environmental issue. So moving forward, Latin America will be a key battleground for the scramble for resources, which the energy transition might seem to imply. It has a disproportionate amount of global mineral reserves. So it has nearly half the world's copper, more than 60% of its lithium and around half its silver. And mining's expanded enormously in Latin America since the early 1990s. So it's moved into to countries where it had little or no presence before, such as uh, the Central American countries, also Ecuador and Argentina. And even in countries like Chile, where it was uh, very well established, it's moved into new regions um, and sometimes kind of regions of, of uh, delicate um, ecosystems. And this expansion has been driven by prices which have been consistently high since the early 90s. The price of silver has risen more than five times and gold and copper more than six times. And governments of all political persuasions have seen mining as a motor for growth and a source of revenue. And this goes right from people we might think of as kind of uh, left-wing populists like uh, Rafael Correa in Ecuador and Evo Morales in Bolivia to kind of real hard-right conservatives or neoliberals, people like Alberto Fujimori in Peru or Álvaro Uribe in Colombia. And Chile is no exception to this. So since democracy returned to Chile in the 1990s, power has alternated between the parties of the left and right, but all of them have, um, have seen mining as an essential um, strategic national industry. So Latin America is arguably the epicenter of the global mining industry and has been so for the last three decades. And now the energy transition looks likely to spark a whole new wave of extraction. However, almost wherever mining has gone in Latin America, conflict has followed. So um, the map shows the spread of mining conflicts through Latin America. There are around 300, I think. Um, as you can see, some countries are worse affected than others but almost nowhere has been spared. So for the industry, this is a big problem. Community resistance has put a stop to mines all over the region. Traditional communities like the Atacameños, generally they don't want mining. They see it as incompatible with their ways of life. But we shouldn't just think of resistance to mining as these kind of isolated communities or pockets of resistance. In fact, sometimes it goes national, as in the case of Panama last year. So in October and November 2023, massive nationwide protests um, put pressure on the Supreme Court to revoke a new mining contract between the Panamanian government and the Canadian copper mining company First Quantum Minerals. And this has essentially shuttered a mine, which represents between 3 and 5% of national GDP in Panama, and 75% of exports. And the Panamanian protesters, they successfully made the following arguments. So first of all, they said, 
Granting vast swathes of territory to a foreign mining company was a violation of national sovereignty. And obviously in Panama, kind of the issue of sovereignty is particularly sensitive given the whole history around the canal. And in fact, in the picture, you can see the young man holding up the placard, which says, Somos canaleros no mineros. In other words, we're people of the canal, not miners. They also argued that the, um, the contract between government and company had been signed without the communities affected by the project receiving adequate consultation. And that in general, the whole thing was rushed through without proper citizen participation. They also pointed to some pretty serious environmental impacts, especially given that the mine is located in um, an area of jungle on Panama's Caribbean coast. So it's a very ecologically sensitive area. And then finally, they made the argument around sort of social and economic justice. They said basically that, okay, you've signed this multi-billion dollar contract with this, um, with this mining company, but we don't see any of this. We don't see the benefits. And although these sorts of anti-mining arguments, they're dependent a bit on local context. In a sense, they're made in one form or another across the region and have resulted in tight restrictions on the mining industry in certain countries. So for example, in Costa Rica and Honduras, both in Central America, they prohibit open pit mining. Various Argentine provinces have similar restrictions, but so far until today, no country has yet gone as far as El Salvador, which is a tiny Central American country about the size of Wales, which prohibits metallic mining and all associated processes in all its forms. So both open pit mining and underground. So, in the face of well-organized popular resistance to mining, the only ways for companies and also governments to force through projects is through subterfuge and violence. However, there was a report published by the International Energy Agency in 2021-22, and they said that if we're to hit net zero globally by 2050, then that's going to require six times more mineral inputs in 2040 than today. And it's not just about lithium, also copper, graphite, cobalt, and others. So it's hard to envisage extraction on the scale that many models are predicting without social conflict and human rights violations on an even greater scale than we see at the moment. And of course, communities in Latin America and elsewhere in the global South shouldn't be sacrificed to help solve a problem, climate change, to which historically their contribution is minimal. But there isn't only one possible energy transition. In other words, it's not a binary choice between continuing with a fossil fuel powered status quo and transitioning to renewable energy and other green technologies. So while some degree of new extraction will, will be necessary, we do face choices about the volume of mineral that we extract, where we extract, who bears the costs, and also how the mining industry is regulated. And the type of energy transition that we opt for will determine how much social and environmental impact it has, and ultimately just how just and sustainable it's gonna be in the medium to long term. So in the case of lithium mining, the transport sector is particularly important. As I mentioned earlier, the single biggest pressure on lithium supply is electric vehicles. And in the UK and the US, the transport sector is the single biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions. So the climate and community project report I referred to earlier, it modeled four different pathways to an electrified transport sector in the US. So the worst case scenario is basically just an electrified status quo. In other words, we move from petrol cars to electric vehicles, but there's no reduction in car ownership, nor any significant change to our urban environments. But in the most ambitious of the four scenarios that the authors modeled, they suggested that we could reduce lithium demand by 66%. And this is down to 
first of all, reducing car ownership. So expanding public transport, particularly rail, um, promoting public transit, so walking and cycling, and also expanding car sharing schemes where possible, as well as densifying urban areas. In other words, kind of combating urban sprawl and making changes to our towns and cities in order to reduce the distances between work, between school, between areas we might socialize in, between shopping areas and other public services. And even under the worst case scenario, lithium demand could be reduced by 29% if the average ba battery capacity were to shrink. In other words, if we were to opt for kind of smaller cars with smaller batteries, rather than uh, medium sized cars, or even the kind of big gas guzzling SUVs, which um, unfortunately are so popular in the US. And this sounds kind of utopian, but actually in recent years, these, these sorts of changes have been happening in cities all over the world, not least in Europe, um, even here. So in London, car use declined by nearly 40% between the year 2000 and 2014. And while these sorts of pol policies, it's true, do tend to generate a certain amount of opposition, sometimes they're controversial. We've seen it here recently with policies like uh, ULEZ in London and the low traffic neighborhoods. But studies have shown um, that they're extremely popular once they're implemented. So I'm coming to the end of my presentation, but I'd just like to leave you with some final thoughts. So first of all, an electrified status quo is not sustainable. It will be far too resource intensive. And here I focused on lithium, but there are other metals which are gonna present us with similar supply chain bottlenecks, including copper, but also aluminum, nickel, steel, cobalt, and others. And the social and environmental impacts of extracting these resources without a serious attempt to reduce our consumption will be catastrophic. It will mean the wholesale displacement of communities like the Atacameños, in other words, that's the destruction of ways of life which go back for centuries. While it may also have serious environmental impacts, which in turn have unforeseen consequences, particularly in relation to water, um, given that mining is a, an extremely thirsty industry, and also biodiversity loss. However, to leave you on a bit of a positive note, there's, there's that cliche about every crisis being an opportunity. And I think that applies here. So, you know, the climate crisis is real and it's serious, but it's also an opportunity to redesign and rationalize our economies and societies so that they're safer, fairer, and less resource intensive. And in fact, I'd go, go further. It's not just an opportunity, it's an imperative. As Sir David Attenborough said, real success can only come if there is a change in our societies and in our economics and in our politics. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Tom. We're now coming to the Q&A session and uh, to, to ask Tom more detailed questions on a, on a very interesting and very professional presentation. Thank you very much. And hopefully that will pique your interest for his book, The Heart of, the, of Our Earth, uh, later on. Who wants to start asking a question? Speak directly into it. Hello. Now, I don't argue at all. I don't argue at all about the changes that you're proposing. But how do you sell these to the to a democracy where they look? Everybody is looking for short term benefits to themselves. Never mind the global consequences. Well, I mean, that's uh, that's the perennial question, really, isn't it? And I mean, that depends on on politics, basically. I mean, I think you have to make the case for these sorts of changes in in a reasoned, um, evidence based manner. But I think, unfortunately, in, in UK politics, at least all at the moment, I think that kind of discourse has sadly been a bit absent in recent years. But I mean, as I said, I think there's there's kind of reason for hope in the sense that um, you know, I think these sorts of of, um, of policies are generally popular once they're implemented. You know, people people want to breathe cleaner air. People um, want their kids to be safe going to and from school and so on. So, um, 
in answer to your question, how do we convince people to kind of snap out of the, their short termism and see the bigger picture? I mean, I don't really have an answer for you. It's a really difficult question, but I'd say, you know, through politics, it's about uh, what, what's a, awareness raising um, and yeah, campaigning, advocacy, etc. And it's a hard slog, of course, you know, these, these kind of battles aren't easily won, but I mean, they have to be fought. Okay, thank you. Who wants to go next? I'm at the back. Um, I was just wondering whether there are any kind of with SQM and their transparency with their, because you were saying about how they've done quite a lot of research, you know, probably more than any independent kind of people have. Is there a lot of transparency with their research or is it hard to get hold of and all of that kind of stuff? Because obviously that would be great to know a bit more about that and in terms of, because I feel like that is something that's limiting progress, I guess, the kind of inadequacy to prove the environmental impacts. So I think they do publish um, some of the results of their, their environmental monitoring uh, online. Um, but yeah, I mean, so at, at the moment I work at the university here looking at the tobacco industry and the tobacco industry also produces its own science, right? But there, there's a clear conflict of interest there. And I'd say the same thing is true with the mining industry. I mean, if SQM or other companies involved in lithium mining were to um, discover that, in fact, yes, they're doing serious long-term environmental damage to this ecosystem, are they likely to stop mining because of that? I doubt it. You know, I think they would just... Um, suppress the finding or uh, manipulate it. So it, it the result is more favorable to them. Okay, thank you. Question online, how can we manage mining responsibly and sustainably? Great, again, another very good question and one to which there's there's not really an easy answer. So, I mean, I think the, the Chilean case is interesting. So, um, President Boric, his national lithium plan, um, it includes, I think, sort of one of the, the pillars of it is about environmental sustainability and trying to, to do mining in a more kind of responsible, environmentally friendly way. I mean, um, it's hard to know to what extent that's sincere or even if it is sin sincere, to what extent it's realistic, because I mean, this national lithium plan is going to be a long-term plan. I think it goes to 2050 or 2060. And Boric, he might be out of power next year. There are elections in Chile in 2025, and his approval ratings are currently low. It looks likely that the right will be back in power, and maybe they'll not be so bothered about social and environmental concerns in, in, in lithium mining. Um, I mean, one of the uh, components of the plan was also to kind of protect ring fence 30% of, of Chile's salaries to so say, okay, 30% of these salaries we're not going to do any mining on. But I mean, that still potentially um, opens up 70% of, of the salaries for, for lithium mining. And environmentally speaking, that could be disastrous. We don't know yet. Um, so yes, I don't really have uh, a straight answer to that question. I think um, mining is, as I said in the presentation, it's an inherently destructive industry. I think it's unrealistic to completely stop all mining, of course, but I think that it should be done to the highest possible environmental standards. I think national states have a role. I think far too often, particularly in Latin America, um, and I think in other places in the global south, states have been weak. Um, they've been prone to capture to a certain extent by um, the mining industry and also other uh, powerful industries like fossil fuels, etc. Um, and they've been sort of unable to defend adequately local communities and um, and ecosystems. There's also a role for international institutions, NGOs, civil society, etc. So um, yeah, there's kind of no one thing which can put the mining mining industry on a, on a, a safer footing. But in a sense, that's kind of um, yeah, everybody's job in a, in, in a sense, you know, we, we all, um, I think, should be thinking about these, these issues and looking to hold the industry to account. Okay. Any questions in the room? Yeah, over there. No, no, because you can shout very loudly, but they won't hear you on Zoom. So you do need the microphone. 
better. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I think you touched on it a few points. It's um, a few times, sorry. It's, it's more the regulation. How do you propose that people can get the um, hold the countries accountable? I mean, I've, I'm a geologist in the mining industry, um, and I'm quite proud of that. The major companies that I've worked for have always followed pretty much to the letter of the law in terms of regeneration. You know, you, you say about destruction. Yeah, I mean, you can't make an egg without breaking an egg right um and if it can't be grown it has to be mined so how do you propose that you that the governments are held accountable i guess that's why so the, the governments are held accountable in order to the, the mining oh sorry that in, in terms of the mining framework um i guess that's the big thing i think the onus on this talk is probably that mining companies kind of do what they want in some respects maybe um so i think how do we how do we engage and and hold the countries accountable for a mining framework that mining companies essentially follow yeah i mean i think that kind of relates to the previous question so i mean it's it's been historically i think very difficult for latin american countries to um develop these kinds of frameworks in order to ensure that the the industry um, kind of behaves responsibly, um, and yeah, I mean there are, I mean in in the book I cover you know many other examples. I mean SQM, the company I referred to in this presentation, is by no means the worst offender at all, and there are some you know like deeply disturbing stories of of environmental damage and human rights abuses and so on. And of course, in fact, you know governments have been complicit in this, so you know. Um, a lot of the time, it, it's true, it's, it might be the companies doing the, the mining, but then governments have been the ones, um, you know, uh, breaking protesters' heads, etc. outside. So, I mean, I think the industries and governments have been complicit to a certain extent. Certainly in, in this case, um, you know, although perhaps I kind of implied that there's maybe reason to be optimistic about the, the uh, lithium strategy in Chile, I'm pretty sure that the Atacameños don't feel that way. You know, historically, their contact with the Chilean state has overall not been not been positive, um, and I think they kind of slightly tar them with the same brush, if you like. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions in the room? I'll ask a question, uh, and that is: if public transport, alternative transport, is part of the solution. Why isn't there more investment in public transport? Because at, at, a, at a larger scale, public transport could actually have a completely different uh, substructure, i.e. hydrogen, as opposed to lithium. And so why, why are we not investing more in public transport? An alternative way, alternative sources of renewables mm -hmm. and transport, such as hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I, I can't speak to the, the hydrogen example um, specifically, uh, I mean, I think, you know, this kind of research and, and development is going on. Um, I mean, I think in, you know, in, in large part, it's, it's a cultural thing, you know. So from the early 20th century onwards, a um, decision was, was made, um, particularly in Western countries, that, you know, we were going to um, bet big time on the use of the private car. And that's how we were going to travel. And that's how we were going to design our cities and so on. And I think today we're... Um, we're now uh, kind of seeing the negative effects of that in terms of, I mean, not only in terms of, of climate change, but also in terms of our own kind of daily lives, how we do things. I mean, obviously in, in Bath, Bath's kind of a, a friendly size, this may not be such an issue, although there are traffic problems here as well. But I mean, particularly in American cities, for example, you know, the distances can just be vast and there's no way to do them unless you've got a car. Um, so I think it, it requires a real cultural shift and a, a change in people's mentality. Um, and of course, yeah, putting pressure on decision makers in order to make these kind of changes. Okay. Right. Oh, another question. That's okay. This must be the, the mining enclave. Is that, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, just first thing is like, do you talk about anything positive towards mining in your book? 
because it seems very like negative, but obviously it's huge investment goes to the communities. They get access to a lot of things. Do you cover that or is it more of a... So, I mean, it's true. It's true. There is, um, I do a chapter on kind of corporate social responsibility of the mining industry. So it's true. Um, so I look at two cases, one in Argentina, one in Mexico. And in Mexico, it's true. The interviewee, he talks about how, you know, the companies come around, they do, you know, uh, initiatives like painting the school. I think also, you know, there was... Um, during the COVID pandemic, they were um, uh, providing ventilators for the local hospital, things like this, etc. So, I mean, it's true. This kind of this kind of work does happen. But I mean, I think, uh, and here I can see kind of an obvious parallel with the tobacco industry, for example. You know, industries which are not harmful don't feel the need to offer these kind of extras or gifts, if you like, to the communities in which they're active. And then just like the big focus here is that what the developed world can do, right? But it's actually the developing world which is causing most of the carbon footprint. And that's going to continue. So South America, India, China, Africa, all that is going to carry on. But I we can do our bit, but we need to kind of reduce that price, that entry point for them to then not push this forward, right? So, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it's the developing world which is causing the problem. I mean, it's... it's global demand for these um, metals and minerals, which is is causing these problems. I mean, and particularly from China. And it's true. I mean, you might say, well, what can we do here about demand coming, coming from China? Um, but I mean, you know, there's also significant demand coming from this country, from the EU and so on. Um, so yeah, I mean, one solution that, that people might moot is, is more mining in, in Europe. Um, and there is lithium in Portugal, for example. But I mean, in Portugal as well, the, the, the industry has produced opposition. There are resistance movements in the areas of Portugal where the lithium mining companies are setting up. Also next month, I'm, um, I'm due to go down to Cornwall to speak to some activists there who are um, opposing, uh, I think there's um, lithium company and tin company, which are uh, doing work in the region. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk to them and hear about their experience as well. Okay, thank you. We've got uh, Fiona uh, online to put a comment in the chat room. Thank you for you, an interesting perspective. I live in Bath, but I'm dialing into this from the World Copper Conference in Chile. There's a very active and positive discussions here with the mining industry, community and representatives regarding sustainable mining. That's just a comment rather than a Thing. It's good to see that we've got somebody who's in Chile actually mm -hmm. coming into this uh, meeting, which is great. Anybody else in the room before we draw things to a conclusion? And hopefully you'll be interested enough to buy uh, The Heart of Our Earth, which Veronica will manfully or womanfully man the, uh, the till. Uh, any final questions? No? Well, in which case, uh, it just remains for us to thank Tom, for a very interesting talk on, on mining in, in South America and some of the considerations uh, that we all need to grapple with. It seems to be clear that at the basis of this is, uh, is a change in attitude by all of us in terms of how we view the environment, not just purely as a resource to be extracted, but actually something that uh, can be sustainably harvested and, and nurtured. So please put your hands together for Tom. Thank you. Okay, Veronica is now going to be, if you want interested in the book, please let Veronica know, and then uh, you can buy the book for £16.50. But whilst you're making your mind up, I just want to tell you about next month. Next month in, in May, we have got the first of our bicentenary collaborations. So our institution is 200 years old this year, and there's other institutions around the UK also 200 years old. One of them is the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, and they're coming to talk to us in May about their past, present, and future. And then in, Ju in uh, June, we have a talk about matters of life and death which is basically experiences and how we've dealt with the pandemic, uh, which should be quite interesting. And then we've got uh, the Oriental Club, which is another bicentenary organization, giving a talk on their past, present and future in July. So I hope you have a good evening and please feel free to step up and have a chat with Veronica.
See you next time.